Cross-Site Scripting is the name for a well-known type of security issue that can affect websites. And I always thought the name XSS is terrible. I think it's confusing a lot of beginners. Well, at least it confused me back when I started. Instead, I think JavaScript code injection or more general HTML injection makes a lot more sense. So I always wondered, why do we have this weird name? cross-site scripting. At some point somebody had to invent this name and somebody had to discover the type of vulnerability in the first place. Another motivation for this video is that of course having names for things like XSS, it is very important when we communicate with each other, but naming things can also cause compartmentalization, mind cuffs, blinds. And hacking in its essence is extremely creative and you should always think outside the box. So in my opinion, it's important to understand the history of any kind of vulnerability because it makes you truly understand the issue to see the wider picture. And that's why we have been on a journey through history, starting around early 1996 with the invention of JavaScript by Netscape. And the following years up until 2000 were riddled with lots of security bugs in the browsers themselves. Netscape but also Internet Explorer had lots of issues that nowadays we would call universal XSS. But as I said, this name didn't exist back then. So let's figure out in this video how we got the name cross-site scripting. When you want to know something about history, you always go check what Wikipedia says. And on the cross-site scripting page we can read, Microsoft security engineers introduced the term cross-site scripting in January 2000. But the source listed for that is a Microsoft blog post from 2009, celebrating the 10 years of cross-site scripting. While this is not the original release, in this blog post David Ross shares some of the names that were suggested. Unauthorized site scripting, URL parameter script insertion or cross-site scripting. Cool, but doesn't help much. I still don't understand why they thought of these names. Why not HTML or JavaScript injection or insertion? Though the URL parameter script insertion is pretty close. Hmm. Besides those name ideas, David also mentioned that they coordinated an advisory release with CERT in the year 2000. So Microsoft worked together on this with the National Computer Emergency Response Team. What was this emergency? Also, why was Microsoft the one to talk about it? I want to better understand what happened in 1999 and 2000. And luckily I was able to talk to David Ross, the author of this article. So I was wondering, back in 99, 2000, how novel was this kind of attack? Were XSS issues already known or was it something the team at Microsoft discovered? And he responded saying, I was doing work related to Georgi Koninsky's bugs, which we termed cross-domain bugs. Recognize this name? If you have seen the previous videos on this topic, you will know Georgi. Yeah, initially my plan was to just make a single video about the origin of the name XSS, but when I started researching deeper, thanks to David Ross, I realized history is a lot richer and to understand how we got to the term cross-site scripting, we had to understand the events that happened before it. So if you haven't seen the previous videos, go check them out, the playlist is linked below. But to briefly summarize, browsers had a lot of interesting security bugs at the time related to JavaScript. And we have looked at several of these original vulnerabilities in action. One of them was, for example, this issue Georgi found in Internet Explorer and it was disclosed in January 2000, just nine days before the world would get to introduce to cross-site scripting. Now this particular browser issue was referred to as cross-frame policy security issue. And that name makes total sense. These vulnerabilities back then were always breaking the browser security boundary between two websites. Of course, these vulnerabilities all work differently, but in the end it's always one website that either embeds another site via iframes or opens another site via window open and somehow exploiting a bug in the browser can access data from the other website, like the cookies or so. So we have an issue related to crossing over into another browser frame cross-frame policy security issue. But these were browser issues. XSS is a vulnerability in websites themselves. And as we now know, in parallel to these kind of browser security research from Georgi and others, a new field of exploitation was slowly boiling up. And of course, Microsoft didn't invent cross-site scripting attacks themselves. 
it was already getting exploited in practice. So have a look at this vulnerability disclosure from August 1998. Hotmail attackments. They have a logo. To all these people complaining about vulnerability names, logos and websites, 1998, there you have it. It is not a new trend. It always happened. And I'm glad that this website exists because it's really hard to find information about the original XSS attacks. But thanks to a website like this, a lot of history is preserved. So let's read a few paragraphs of this. This page describes a security problem that Blue Adept discovered with Microsoft's Hotmail service on August 28, 1998. As you probably know, Hotmail is Microsoft webmail service, so email in the browser. Users clicking on mail attachments in Hotmail are vulnerable to having their passwords stolen by malicious users. Further down, they explain how you can send a Hotmail attachment yourself. They have here this mailmess.html document, which you can send yourself as an attachment, and when opening it in Hotmail, a payload triggers. Now, the payload in this example is actually a Macromedia Shockwave plugin. But look at this comparison site. Which free mail services are safe? So Microsoft Hotmail is vulnerable to Java applets and a few other services as well. But look there. They also list which services are vulnerable to injecting script tags, hidden script tags and meta tags. I'm not 100% sure what the difference here is, but clearly this is a classic case of cross-site scripting. It just didn't have a name yet. As you know, cross-site scripting is a vulnerability where you can inject JavaScript code into a website that another user then executes. And so of course, XSS can only emerge on a service where users communicate. The web was just slowly becoming more interactive and webmailers were obviously a prime breeding ground for this. So back in August 1998, they tried to raise awareness of the issue of HTML code or more specifically applet and JavaScript tags embedded within emails. This of course triggered lots of news articles as well. And look what they write here. We are not trying to use this as an illustration that there's a problem with Java applets in general, but rather that there is a problem with the user interface or filtering design of the web-based email services, Kavinka said. And in another article they wrote, some free email providers, including Yahoo Mail, already filter out JavaScript code from incoming messages. Kavenka is urging Hotmail to implement the same restriction. And in the meantime, he recommends that Hotmail users disable JavaScript in their browsers. It makes total sense to me that the first XSS issues emerged in webmailers. It's a really straightforward attack. You have emails, emails that also probably support HTML formatting, and you just add some malicious JavaScript code inside of that. And now slowly the puzzle pieces fall together. Think about the big picture. On one side, Microsoft is battling against JavaScript related bugs in their Internet Explorer, where one website can run some malicious JavaScript to somehow access data from another website. And on the other front, Microsoft is battling against malicious JavaScript hidden inside of emails at Hotmail. This is so fascinating to me because from the outside at the time, Microsoft looked like they don't care about security. They don't manage to fix issues in Hotmail, lots of angry news articles about it. And as you all know, Internet Explorer has a very bad reputation for being super insecure and buggy as well. But Microsoft is a huge corporation and they had a security team that really cared. But if you ever worked in a huge corporation, you can imagine what kind of uphill battle that must have been. And so at the end of 1999 and early 2000, David Ross and his team of other security researchers at Microsoft summarized and generalized this new type of JavaScript related issue within websites. Here is the original press release from Microsoft in February 2000. Microsoft has identified a serious security vulnerability that could potentially affect many websites and website users. The vulnerability, now known as cross-site scripting, is equally possible on all Windows products and does not result from a defect in any of them. Instead, it results from certain common web coding practices. To me, it seems like from their experience with issues in Hotmail, they understood the underlying issues of XSS being the result of bad coding practices, not properly encoding the output. Now, let's continue with their FAQ where they show an example attack with HTTP GET. This is what today we would call reflected XSS. 
So if you're an attacker, you would add this link to your website. It's a link that looks like it's going to Microsoft, but the link target is actually pointing at another website, foo.com, with a vulnerable parameter ID. Supposedly, this IP parameter is reflected onto the page. So you can inject a script tag that loads a malicious JavaScript file from your evil server and execute it. And when I saw that, the name finally clicked for me. Let me explain. Nowadays, when you want to show somebody an XSS issue, you show it with a link. You would just straight show the vulnerable domain. In this case, you remove the anchor tag and just focus on the link target. And that is why the name XSS was always confusing to me. If you look at the vulnerable link itself, there's no cross-site scripting. You inject a script tag into the vulnerable website. Why not call it JavaScript or HTML injection? But Microsoft was coming from a time when Georgi and others found vulnerabilities in browsers where one website can use JavaScript bugs to access another website. They called it cross-frame bugs. And so if you add the surrounding anchor tag again, then this almost looks like a typical cross-frame bug. It's a malicious website that can access data from another website, but it works differently, right? It's not a bug in the browser, it's a coding error in the target website. And so seeing the example payload with a link like this, suddenly it makes sense. To them, it's one website being able to inject JavaScript into another website. And that's probably why they called it cross-site scripting. Well, I still think nowadays it would be better if we rename it to JavaScript or HTML injection. Because I think injection is such an important general concept existing everywhere. Command injection, SQL injection, JavaScript injection, burger injection, all the same idea. But now that I understand the history, where it all came from, now the name makes sense to me. I can accept it. Anyway, as you can see, the researchers at Microsoft back then understood that XSS is a big deal. It's not just a challenge at Hotmail, it affects everything. And that's why we need an emergency advisory to inform the public and spread the knowledge about how to fix these issues. This information has to reach every web developer. So the third released CA2002, malicious HTML tags embedded in client web requests. Because one source is injecting code into pages sent by another source, here they use the word injection, this vulnerability has also been described as cross-site scripting. Web page developers should recode dynamically generated pages to validate output. And in their understanding malicious code mitigations, they go into really great detail how to fix it. It's really interesting to see that the researchers really understood the full extent of the issue and that output has to be encoded according to the context. So in an HTML context or block level element context, they need to encode brackets. In an attribute context, they need to take care of quotes and double quotes. And within a script tag, they have to filter for typical JavaScript symbols. But of course, it was not all perfect because this is actually not enough. If you only filter or encode semicolon, parentheses, curly braces, and new lines and other JavaScript symbols, you can still inject a script end tag. And then you are in the HTML context or block level context again. Now you can use allowed HTML symbols to do other stuff. But that's just a detail that immediately jumped out to me. Anyway, I think now we understand the origin of cross-site scripting. But now I have a question for you. If you are old and you remember any public XSS vulnerabilities from before the Hotmail attackments, please share them with me. I would love to find out more about these early XSS issues from before the issue had this name. That would be awesome. Anyway, this journey into hacking history was super interesting to me and I hope you also learned a lot. And if you want to hear more hacker history, I also made a video about the term script kitty. So go check that out.